Hey, welcome to Life in the Leadership Lane. I'm your host, Bruce Waller, where I am getting to talk to leaders that are making a difference in the workplace. Uh, how did they get started in their careers and what are they doing to stay there? What are they doing to accelerate as leaders? And today, today I have another special guest on the show. Today, I'm getting to talk to Latoya Watley. Latoya is the Vice President of Human Resources and Training at Sinelli Concepts. She is also very energetic, very passionate. I got a chance to see her at one of the Mid-Cities HR luncheons in 2019, and I am honored to have you on the show today. Thank you. I appreciate that, Bruce. Well, you're welcome. I remember the first time I met you, you were just so passionate, and I was like, man, that just like drew me in. I want to give a real quick shout out to a mutual friend of ours, uh, Beth G. Beth is with Partnership yeah. Employment, a uh, staffing company in the DFW area, and she actually connected us again. Yes, love Beth. She is an absolute gem. Yeah, she's phenomenal. She's a great connector. Uh, she actually connected me with Annie Carolla, who I also had on the show earlier this year, so much appreciated. And so I, again, appreciate you coming on today. I would love to, man, we're going to talk leadership, we're going to talk training, uh, but I want to start, uh, if you could share a little bit about your company and Sinelli Concepts and how they serve their customers. Absolutely. So Sinelli Concepts was founded by Jeff Sinelli. Um, he's a restaurant entrepreneur and it started about 1997. And he's launched different brands like Genghis Grill, which which superior sandwiches, as you see by the bun, um, <laughs> Bergesa Burgers. He's acquired concepts like Pachugo Gelato, if you've ever heard of that one, and just lots of different other ones that are in the works. So it's a great company, um, full of restaurants, a lot of food trucks, and we're looking into some other things. It's just growing. No telling where you'll see us next. Oh man, that's exciting. I uh, man, I we are actually. Uh, recording after lunch. I'm glad I didn't record before <laughs> lunch or I would be starving right now. I'm a big fan of Witch Witch. So listen, we're going we're gonna to talk more about that more. I want to even talk about culture. Uh, I remember during the presentation, you talked about uh, culture and uh, a lot of different things around that. But I want to start with Latoya's story. I, I want to I wanna know a little bit more about you and where did you grow up and how in the world did you get into the world of HR and training and development? I'll tell you a story. I like that. Um, well, to start off, I am from the area, uh, born and raised in Dallas, Texas, suburbs around Dallas all my life. And, you know, I have two amazing parents who are driven, which has definitely um, helped me a lot in my life. Um, I have a beautiful daughter who's a senior in high school, an amazingly supportive husband. And, you know, I just, I've been at restaurants all of my adult life. You know, my freshman year in college, I started off with Chili's and worked my way up. And my mother would tell you that I have been training people, or as she would like to say, bossing people around since I was a little girl. So it really came natural for me. I'm really straightforward. I'm a rule follower. Um, compliance is key for me. I follow the rules no matter what. Um, so once I got in the business, it was just a natural fit, you know, to, I memorized the rules, I got them down, and I just worked my way up. So during that process, it was one of the things that I easily navigated through the training pieces, and I wanted to, you know, set some goals of what I wanted to do for myself. Um, I'm a real big goal setter. So once I looked at the restaurant industry and looked at the corporate infrastructure, I started thinking about, okay, where do I see myself in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years and beyond? Um, and at the ultimate goal became human resources, you know, just understanding that training and development was a principle of it. And I really enjoyed all the pieces of HR. And I was like, you know what, that is the ultimate goal. I want to um, make my way towards human resources and, uh, learning all the facets of the restaurant industry has helped me in my career tremendously. So um, I am definitely, um, I'm sympathetic to what's going on right now at the restaurants. And, you know, it's something that I completely understand. And, you know, I feel for all those out there right now. 
Yeah, so uh, just so everybody knows, we're taping this in November of, of 2020. We're still navigating through COVID, a uh, challenging time. Um, and so, and this is actually gonna play in, in December. And I, I, you know, we're not through it, but we've, we're learning how to navigate through it. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Wow, Chili's, you know, it seems like about every uh, fifth guest I have on the show has a connection to chill. It's like the six degrees of chilies. Um, you know, uh, Diane Sanford. Um, I mean, there are Denise Snow. I mean, there are many. Um, Roseanne Garza have all worked or been part of that chilies, uh, that chilies uh, 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 family. Yeah, it's a great, great company. You know, everybody loves to be a chili head. <laughs> chili head that's it okay i was actually thinking of that that word you know uh we grew up in the so uh we grew up in oklahoma and, and have lived in dallas for the last 25 years and when our kids went to school there was like a chili's that was like the hangout uh for friday night football and uh the place the place to be and so um so uh so you, man you uh, one of the, one of the things that stood out when you just talked was about goal setting um, that really like that resonates with me and not just in not just goal setting, but you, you're talking about, I wanted to see myself 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years from now. And so, uh, I find that very fascinating. I, I would love to, um, I would love to hear like, okay, so you, you decided I'm, this is what I want to do. And you start going down that path. I, I was just wondering, was there like a, like, was there that moment? or that you just said, you know what, I, I know I decided to go down this path. Now this validates that I love what I do. You found your lane, you found your purpose, you found your calling. Bruce, I would actually say there's probably about a couple of those moments. Um, but unfortunately I witnessed an event in my career that really resonated with me that human resources, it sometimes gets, it gets a bad rep. And I think we've heard that before. There's a um, stigma around human resources. And I was able to talk to some other employees at one of the concepts I was at, at the time. And there was several situations going on. And I felt like human resources was out of touch. Mm -hmm. It was at that point in the conversation I was having with several representatives that it hit me that this is my purpose because I believe if you are a part of something, you have to truly understand it. And in my career, my restaurant career, before I even went into management, it was very important for me to be able to work all the positions in the restaurant. Even when they told me that's not necessary, I was like, no, I, I need to know this. I cannot tell a cook to hurry up and get those steaks out if I don't know what that feels like and I haven't worked those shifts. So it was very important for me. And what I have found throughout my career is that having that insight, it really helps on the HR front because I never get out of touch. And I felt like that department, that company I was at at, at the time, they were out of touch. You could tell they had probably been in the ivory tower a little bit too long and they didn't know what it was like to be on the front line. They didn't understand employees having real concerns and not knowing or feeling comfortable to go to someone in the office. It was so strange to me and I, I always wanted to get into a company where I can make sure that any employee felt comfortable walking up to me, coming into my you know, office just to say hi, let me know what's going on. I wanted that. And that's how I knew that I was making the right decision. I love that. Man, that's fantastic. You know, when I uh, started at my company in, um, when I moved to Dallas, Texas, in the mid 90s, the company I started with, they said, basically, if you're going to be a, uh, in sales, or if you're going to be in management, you need to train from the ground, uh, you need to start from the ground up. Well, I'm in relocation. So moving furniture. And I was like, wait a minute, I, I have a college degree, shouldn't I be at the you know, shouldn't I have a manager, you know, up in the in the ivory tower, or shouldn't I have a, a desk in the ivory tower. And I will tell you today that that experience, you can't even, you can't buy the experience. Being out there on the front line, 
working with, in your case, you're working with the cooks, you're working with the service, you're working with everyone, you get it. Uh, I was working with the, the, the people that were, you know, on the front line, packing the boxes, loading the trucks, carrying the pianos up three flights of stairs. Um, tough, but, but today I can relate to that. It's so invaluable. I love how you, how you shared that. Well, thank you. It, it really is. Um, I think the best leaders understand that. And that was enough, another thing I was able to look at. I looked at those who really had significance in my career, those who stood out to me that I was like, I want to model their leadership style. And when I looked back, I noticed that they all had that in common. They all worked their way up and they had this kind of presence when they came in. It wasn't, um, you know, an air that was so stuffy that no one felt comfortable walking up to them. They came in with this presence of really knowing who you were and they remembered you. I, I just remember that feeling being a bartender or working at an opening uh, of a new location and having the regional VP or the VP of the company or even, you know, back in the day, uh, Doug Brooks and, you know, uh, Norman Brinker come in and having a real conversation. And that meant the world to me. Oh, that is, man, that is, this is giving me chills. I, uh, when I, I, I give uh, uh, a lot of different presentations and, and one of those, when I talk about, you know, finding your lane, I talk about uh, setting who goals. So not just what goals, but who goals. And when you're thinking about your goals, not thinking about what you want to do, but who you want to be. And you're sitting here talking about who goals. And this is just, I mean, because at the end of the day, I think, I think that is a incredible approach when you start, you can look around and say, hey, who is doing it the way I want to do it? That's what, okay, now what are they doing to help me get there? I, I want to, I want to, I want to touch on that because I want to, uh, my next um, question was going to be around who were some like, who were some mentors? I know you mentioned Doug Brooks, uh, obviously I've, I've heard his name mentioned many times when I've talked to Chili Heads, um, but who were some different mentors in your life that have helped you and shaped you uh, to, to where, you know, where you are today? Oh, there's been so many, as you can imagine. And, you know, I've never really been of a formalized mentor, mentorship program, um, other than once in my career. Um, I was part of the first mentor group that Chili's had many, many years ago for women. So that was a great experience. But most of my mentors came about from just instances like you just said. Um, people that I looked up to, people who I know I can still call to this day. Um, my last manager I had before I went in and started managing restaurants, um, I still have a relationship with her to this day. And I loved her tenure with the brand. I loved her commitment, her loyalty, and her, her drive to push people to their levels, you know, levels that she could see that at times we couldn't see. And she worked so hard to make sure we had opportunities and, you know, the time never became too much for her. She scheduled time to come in. It's those type of people that I remember. Um, I had a mentor at Corner Bakery who I, once again, still speak to to this day. And, you know, she was over strategy and training and just a wonderful human being in general. And I'm so happy that now we're able to be even friends. But when I have an issue, and if I'm struggling with something, I am texting her, I'm calling her, let's do breakfast, let's meet up, I, I need to pick your brain. And she does the same to me. And I remember the first time she did that to me. And I was like, you're asking me a question. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, a <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And she was like, yes, I value your opinion. And it was the most beautiful thing to me because it showed that even though she had tenure over me and at a time I reported to her in our career that she still saw that I had value. I had something to bring to the table and she wanted to pick my brain about things. So, you know, it was a humbling experience and I really, she just grew 10 notches in my book. <laughs> You know off that um example alone that's fantastic what what uh man I, I was actually as you were sharing that i was thinking about you know annie carolla she's a global uh, global talent acquisition leader at um hks and she talked about when people are seeking relationships if they're seeking them with a growth uh, a growth mindset they can find mentors pretty much anywhere 
Would you agree with that? I absolutely would agree with that. You know, if you want, if you want to be nurtured, <laughs> it will happen. Some <laughs> come in and they will water you. <laughs> they will make sure that they, that you get the sunlight that you desire. It will happen. I love that. You know, uh, that's just like your mentor. You were just now talking about she, even though you look at her as a mentor, she still has that growth mindset to come back to you and ask you what you think. Uh, I, that's a great, great story. I love that. I love that. Um, I would, um, you know, I want to, you know, as, as we're talking leadership here, uh, I, I would love to hear, you know, we just talked about, you know, it's been a challenging time, especially uh, for, for the restaurant industry. How, how have you, how have you had to shift your leadership in 2020 or have you had to shift? I wouldn't say that I've had to shift my leadership. I would say that I would, I've had to, I, I've had to change the way I do things. So my leadership style hasn't changed. I'm, I've always been extremely um, empathetic with people. And so that definitely has been needed more than ever. I've definitely spoken to several um, people in my network, my peers, and uh, that's been part of the conversation of we have to be empathetic now. So I'm very thankful I've already had that skill, but I've had to shift the way I handle situations and how I communicate with people. Um, when people are going through a hard time, not being able to actually schedule a coffee break like I would if we were in the office, or have them come over um, and just spend a little one-on-one -on -one time. Let's walk around the block. You know, our office is downtown Dallas. So let's walk around the block and discuss this. That was always helpful if people were struggling. So to have someone struggle and not be able to truly look them in the eye and discuss this with them, um, it's been different. And having to reach out by phone, you know, as people are maybe trying to hide how they're feeling because they, um, may be a little insecure with the situation that's going on and not wanting to show weakness. Um, it's pulled on my heartstrings quite a bit. So I've had to get creative. Um, we've done several things um, that, you know, have worked out. You know, we have little different huddles through Zoom that we have twice a week to get everyone involved. And we're a very silly concept. If you look at anything which which we're a little quirky. So that's helped out quite a bit, but in the beginning it was, it was difficult and I definitely had to shift and make sure I made more phone calls, um, reached out in different ways, sent little texts here and there, you know, to show them that, hey, we're, we're still here. You know, you're not in this alone. Um, please don't, don't think that. So that's really been the shift that I've had to make. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. I was given a presentation yesterday. I called it um, Great Leaders Are Grateful Leaders. And I shared a statistic that uh, I had read in the book, Everybody Matters, and uh, by Bob Chapman. I'm not sure if you've read that book, but he shared that 88%, okay, 88% of people in, the, uh, in a company through this survey said that they don't feel like they are heard or they're cared for. And so I shared with the group that I said, you know, for me, that's a big number. It's hard to believe that that number. But then I went and asked a friend who's a leader in their company, not the top leader, uh, leading from the middle and said, hey, how, how do you feel about this number? Is this number a high number? It just, it feels high. And, and that person told me, they said, well, um, I, you know, we're into three months of COVID and I haven't got a call from my top leader yet. And that really hit me hard. So you're talking about being finding creative ways to stay connected with your team members. I love that. So so uh, through yes. through texts, through calls, um, and just whatever through being intentional to do that, right? Yes, I, I will put up a bad sign if I have to. Um, it, it is being <clears throat> intentional, you know, and. You know, little things that I know that certain team members will like, sending that little gift, that text to them. You know, um, we had a text one time going around with a Cheeto. I mean, it's just little simple <laughs> things that you know will make people smile. And we have some great members on our team on our team that have done the same thing. Some great people who have tenure, so they understand as well. I've been able to talk to them about, you know, I need your help with this. And they've loved it, you know, that, you know, I'm I'm looking out 
towards them for advice. You know, how can we be better at this? What is there anything different we can be doing? And I think that's important. Just because you don't have a certain title doesn't mean you're not a leader in the company. So that's oh, man. The things we've tried to really. Oh, that's so good. Just because you don't have a certain title doesn't mean you're a leader. Oh, that is fantastic. Okay. So when I was at this Mid-Cities HRA luncheon, MCHRA, uh, Sherm chapter in the Euless Bedford area, f fantastic chapter. Uh, you, were, you were talking about training and development, uh, some different concepts around that. I, I was just curious, you know, what is it about training and development that, that you love so much? What is it that I, what isn't it? <laughs> um, I believe that the foundation of every company, it revolves around training. If you want to see a successful company, you look at their training program, you know, you look at how, how important it is for them to develop people. You know, where does that, you know, rank on their initiatives? And you'll find that it's high. If they're a successful company, it will be high. When you make sure your employees are trained, they feel comfortable in the role. And isn't that what everyone wants? They want to be comfortable. I got hired on here. I know I have the skill set. So if you do your job and you invest in me by training me, then I'm going to put out and make sure the company is successful. But if you don't, then I don't feel secure. I don't know what's going on. And I become, you know, a little worried about my future. And I get overwhelmed by tasks because I don't know how to do them correctly. So that doesn't bode well for mental health. It doesn't bode well for uh, morale. And that's not something you want to see in any company. So I am a, obviously a <laughs> huge, you know, cheerleader when it comes for training, uh, investing the time on the front end. And then you can hold people accountable to the expectations. But if we haven't done our jobs, who are we to say that they weren't the right fit? Shame on us. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I agree. I, I remember uh, early in my career, I got the opportunity to, to lead. I left my the company and I got the opportunity to lead another company and I brought a guy with me. And uh, he was like, that was his gift, training people. And so we, we went over to the company and at the time they had very poor quality scores. And by the time we left, we were the, at the top. And it was, all comes back to the training. But I, I'm curious, what do you have to say about, um, you know, I hear, like, the, is it a myth uh, whenever you hear something like, well, whenever uh, times are tough and, and numbers, you know, uh, revenue's not coming in, training is usually the first thing to get cut or, or be laxed on. What, what do you say to that? Is that a myth? Oh, I wish I could say it's a myth. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is a, a real statement. And I think it's because a lot of people don't understand the value of training. Um, we see it as a luxury, you know, the operations piece, that's what you need and you have to have. Um, but if you can operate on it, then you should be able to train it, right? But we both know that's not the case. Every person who knows how to do a skill doesn't make them a trainer. It doesn't mean that they can take someone brand new and actually develop them into the role and the position they were hired to be in. So that's where the misconception comes from that anyone who does this job, they can show someone else how to do it. It's just a shadow. That's all you're doing. Not true at all. <laughs> yes, that reminds me of the time. I, uh, this is a true story. I remember uh, when I first started at my company years ago when I was training on the trucks and they said, just follow that guy. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that was not the way that was not the way. Oh man. So, um, what about, um, what about, uh, uh, someone that says, Hey, my, uh, my company doesn't really offer training. Are, are there some things that people should consider or they can do to go skill up and train on their own? Absolutely. So we are in a day and age where resources are truly just at your fingertips. And there are so many free resources out there. Um, I find myself just up at two o'clock in the morning on my time. I am horrible about that. But if you're somewhere and um, you don't offer, your company doesn't offer the training or you're wanting to implement some training and it's not available, I would suggest you look up different um, 
different programs that are out there already. There's a lot of libraries. There's a lot of content out there with different companies that they are providing different interpersonal skills, different um, skill sets like Microsoft Excel, um, even speaking, you know, communication, how to work within different teams, how to, you know, how to be a project manager. There's lots of things out there that you can get involved in. And if your company doesn't have a program, I, I always say create it. You know, um, <laughs> if you're hired for a role and you see things are needed, then look for a way to get scrappy and just start doing it. You know, just little bitty pieces, just enough so you can show that there was, um, there's results here. Look at what I made happen at, in this department or with this project, just by adding this to it. And just be able to show that there's some return on investment here. Just think if we actually put some time into this and actually you know, let her go and flourish with this program. So there's lots of ways you can get creative. I've worked at some companies where I've been told you're a one woman department. I've heard that many times. And within a year or two, I have five people in my department. And that is development, you know, it's just looking at the people we have and seeing that we have a lot of great people. If I can borrow them for a project here or there, train them, teach them how to do a certain skill, well then, you know, I think I get to take them then. <laughs> I, I love that. Oh my God, that is fantastic. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, you have a passion for training people, but not everybody wants to learn. How do you know who to spend your time with? That's, you know what, it's easy to tell. You, you have those individuals who they are, they're hungry for information. And they usually find a way to be around you. Because as we said earlier, people see that you're willing and you're wanting to share, you're wanting to give, you know, knowledge to others. So they kind of hover around you, they want to know if there's anything they can help with If can they come in, you know, come in a little early to work with you on this. So I, I always say, if you have the initiative and you want to learn who am I to say that I don't have time for it. So that's usually what happens. Those who don't want to learn, um, usually they end up getting jealous by the others who are striving, but they don't realize it takes work. You know, you can't just say you want something without working on it, but work. just invest in those who want it. You know, oh. they be there for them. I love that. It takes work. I, I love that. Uh, if, if you don't have a program created, that is fantastic. Now, do you at Sinelli Concepts, do you have a uh, leadership development program or um, in, in your company? So our programs are a little different. So what we try to do is try to partner people um, in their departments with the roles that they want. And we're, we're really big on we have a lot of advisors we'll bring in at certain times. Um, we have a lot of people that we've worked with in the past that they stay partners of ours. So, you know, if we like to bring people in at certain roles and let them grow with us, we're real big on bringing people in, maybe at a, a manager role, but we know there's potential there that with the right guidance, you will soon be a director and maybe a VP. And as we acquire the concepts, maybe you can run this department at this concept, all these different things, how we look at it. So it's really about partnering you with the right leader who's going to help you move forward and putting you out there with certain projects and giving you those assignments and having someone work on that with you. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. Yeah, I, uh, I serve uh, Texas, uh, Texas Sherm State Council. In 2021, I'm going to be uh, helping them with their leadership development program. So I'm very, like, very interested in that. I've been, I've been part of many development programs uh, I've been part of a design team for an in-house program. And so regardless, uh, at the end of the day, it's like, like what you were talking about, though. It's about, you know, just getting everybody moving in the same direction, helping each other, um, helping. And I love the, the buddy system. Uh, I love that, uh, that concept. That, that's fantastic. Not only does it help them with the training, but just the, the connecting with people, too, right? Yes, definitely. Because as we know, just because you were trained on this doesn't mean you're not going to have questions later on, right? So you're going to have these questions and now you feel comfortable because the person you were working with, you can always go back to them. So really it's created a mentor for you without you formalizing it. You know, one of the, uh, I, I want to just touch on one more thing before we move on here. And that is you mentioned earlier 
uh, you, you mentioned uh, we were talking about communication as well. And I, I really think that that's one of the biggest areas that, that people can benefit from it, uh, on training is communication. As a matter of fact, uh, Sherm had put out a question about, you know, someone coming into a new role uh, from an entry level perspective, I, I believe is the, the, was the question. Uh, what is the one skill that, that you, you know, that they need to really work on? And I said, you know, communication, people skills. And so how, how in, in, in your opinion, with all the training, um, is there like, a, do you have like, hey, these are the most important, where does communication fit uh, in that training? That definitely happens in the beginning. And I, and I believe you're absolutely right that that's probably the number one thing, entry level um, employees, they, they need to grasp, you know, is getting a hold of what does communication look like? What is expected? Um, do I respond to this email? Um, how soon do I need to tell my direct report this? Or when should I let somebody know that I saw this? Um, it's very important. And for me, um, I, I, that's something that needs to happen within the first 30 days. Um, that's part of that onboarding. This is how we communicate at this company because all companies are different. You know, I've worked at four different companies and the communication styles have been different at all four. So it's really about understanding your company and how people communicate and what's expected to make sure no one's waiting on you or you're dropping the ball when you didn't even know. Because that's the biggest thing, right? When we talk about training, people usually mess up, but it's yeah. things they know and that's why they messed up. Yeah, no, you're, you're right on. Okay, so I know a lot of the uh, audience members also are top level leaders like yourself. Uh, what, what are some things that you, you do, you know, from a top level leadership as far as continued development? I mean, like, you got to where you are today because of all of that training and development that you've been through. How do you, how do you keep, how do you accelerate? How do you stay there? You know, I'm always learning. I am always taking courses. I'm always working on the next thing. Um, and I read a lot, you know, I want to make sure I know what's going on. I love picking the brains of others. You know, I am all about asking people questions and talking to my peers about what, what's going on in your space, you know, and going to seminars and conferences. I think that's very important. Getting to know other people. Um, you talked about me speaking, um, at the luncheon we had, and I love meeting different people from different areas, even different industries. Um, to be able to understand, you know, some of the different challenges they're having and, you know, quiz myself, how would I handle that challenge if that were to happen to us and making sure I'm always, you know, um, on the path I'm supposed to be on, but I am always taking a course. I am always going through some type of certification. Um, my daughter, who's a senior, she's like, why are you always in school? <laughs> taking a test you're always doing this i do not want this for my life <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic why are you always learning <laughs> <laughs> all the time that's what she says <laughs> that is super fantastic i absolutely love that you know you you said something that i i didn't really think about um whenever i'm going to different conferences and i get to see leaders uh like yourself speak um, I, I'm there to like, I'm trying to learn from you, but you're also trying to learn from the audience. I didn't even think about that. Yes. You think about it. There's so many different examples. And there's so many different types of leaders there. People are from different industries who go to these different events and it's, you know, it, it's fruitful. It is so fruitful to go through and hear what's going on in the grocery stores, what's going on in the, um, the car space, real estate, all these different areas of things that could come my way, you know, just knowing the industries and how they work. So it's really absorbing everything that's being said, how they feel about things going on in their company. You know, I want to make sure I'm on top of my game and I can be ready, you know, if that were to happen to us at any time. Yeah, that's, that's super fantastic. I want to, I want to shift a little bit. We talked about, you know, you, leading your team in, in the organization, but I'll, I want to talk about leading you. And uh, one of the things that I always try to pull out is just something that, you know, maybe a discipline or a practice that you have, but I, I want to shift just a little bit. Uh, and I want to talk about this goal setting um, that you mentioned earlier, because I'm, I'm a big goal setter too. And I, I was wondering, would you, could you, uh, or would you mind sharing maybe 
a, a practice you have around goal setting? Like, uh, is this a, a weekly thing, a monthly thing? Do you do it at the end of the year? What is that? Like, what does that look like? Sure. Well, basically, I um, it's funny. I'm actually working on my 20, uh, 21 goals. Um, I've been formalizing those for the past three weeks. So about this time in Q4, um, I start looking at my goals for the next year. And at least once a month, I revisit those. And at least once a quarter in my journal, I actually update where I am on that goal. You know, so if I've already accomplished it, you know, I'm marking it off. If there's something else I can add to it, because maybe I accomplished it in June, um, you know, early. So maybe I can start working on something else at this time. But it's something that I document. I believe in writing it in my journal. I don't actually put it. I'm very digital, but this is the one thing that I do not do on my phone or tablet. I actually have a hardback journal that I write my goals in and I update in. And I think it's almost, number one is going back to my childhood of how I started journaling. Um, like I said, I've been a goal setter since I was a little girl, um, is how I was raised. So I think it gives me that feeling of like I'm still doing the same thing instead of the spiral journal, you know, that you had in school. Um, I now have my hardback fancy uh, journal that I've spent way too much money on. Um, <laughs> but I, I write in it first thing, in, you know, in the morning I go through this exercise and I'm always going back and reading through it to make sure I'm on pace. Yeah, that's, 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 that's fantastic. I love it. So you use the word journal, you use the word update and you use the word quarterly. Um, that, so, so when you're setting goals, um, you, you know, obviously your organization has goals that you, you know, you're trying to align with too, but w what about personal goals? Is there like a, like for me, you know, I have these different, uh, I call it a, a wheel and I, I, and I'm trying to, these different uh, areas in this wheel, uh, you know, financial goals and uh, pers you know, personal goals, community goals, spiritual goals, uh, business goals. Uh, do you have like some uh, a process you you try to build goals around? I do. So I have four pillars, and um, my goals. This is how I know I've gotten to a certain area in my life because my goals actually align within these four pillars. So they are. I have my. I'm very spiritual. So I have my kingdom goals. I have my personal goals. I have my family goals, and I have my professional goals. And what I have found as I've gotten older is that they truly all, they are starting to come together. You know, they are meeting in the same space. They're working, you know, around each other. It's like, it's almost a nucleus is the purpose of everything I'm doing. I'm able to hit all four of my goals in my role that I'm in today in life. And it really um, has been a great journey to find, um, you know, that, that level, that, that, you know, point in my life where they all do come together. That's fantastic. Oh man, this is so good. Like I'm, oh man, this is like you, this, you've hit my, uh, my red button here. I'm so by the way, you said earlier you had your, your bat light. Uh, I'm, you know, my middle name is Wayne, by the way, did you know that Bruce Wayne? Is it really? Yes. That is <laughs> so, so funny. I meant to say something earlier. I was like, yes, okay. I knew there was a reason for us to be connected. Oh, man, <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, I want to know um, uh, from the – so I have had people ask me this. And they're like, hey, you know what? I, I don't know how you set long-term goals. How, how do you do that? How do we know, you know – I was sharing a story about whenever I uh, – turned 40 or I was 40, 40, 41, 42. Um, I had heard from about these who goals and they said, Hey, why don't you, you know, think 10 years ahead and think about the person you want to become and start writing those down. So what I did was I wrote down, okay, uh, when I'm 50, I want to be married for X number of years. I want to have uh, two children that have graduated high school, one in college. I want one to be a junior. I was picturing myself in that time frame, and I want to. I want to write a book. I want to do all these different things. And whenever I turned fifty, I went back and I looked at all those goals, and it was amazing how I accomplished every one of them except one, and that was writing that book. And then I said, you know what? I got to do it. And so I finished and I wrote the book and published a book. But, uh, but, but I was looking at it there. What would you say to someone listening or, or watching today about long-term goals? How could they, 
how do you do that and, and how, how might they might think about it? I think it comes with knowing yourself. You know, you, you have to understand what it is you want to accomplish in life. You know, you can't talk about the future if you don't understand that. You don't know what it is you want to accomplish. So I think it's first knowing what you want to accomplish, what's your, what's your overall purpose, and then fast tracking it. How do you get to that point? Um, my, my purpose has always been, I, I want to supply people with the resources they need to succeed. And I have found that that hits in all specters of my life. You know, whether it is on a personal page, you know, helping those I love and my family and friends see their potential and help them in different ways. Um, professionally, obviously, that is basically my whole job, <laughs> what I do. And, you know, it's understanding how can I do that on a larger scale? And that's how I look at it. So by different positions that I get, I know I'm able to reach a wider group of people. And so that really helps me and my goals and look at what I need to accomplish to make sure um, my things are aligned with my kingdom goals and what I plan on doing on this earth. I, man, I, I man, this is so good. So anybody who's listening right now, this is gold. I'm just saying this is absolutely fantastic. And I appreciate you uh, sharing all of that uh, as well. And, and so uh, what I took away from that is really purpose. You, you really need to figure out what your purpose uh, is and try to start aligning with that purpose, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh, man. Oh, that's so good. Okay, I do have one more question before we uh, accelerate here. And, and I always like to know, like, was there some advice that you were given, uh, maybe from your parents, maybe from someone you worked with? Was there advice you received that you like or find yourself still sharing with people today? It's so good. I, you know, there's several. <laughs> I, I, want, we, I want to hear them all. <laughs> <laughs> I would say probably the number one thing that sticks with me and I often say a lot um, is, you know, don't take life so serious, you know, and I, you know, when what the Joker came out, you know, what was it about eight years ago now? And everyone was going around saying, why so serious? You know, it's something that I actually will go and walk into somebody's office if I see them frowning and they, their hands are like this over their head, like, what do I do? And I will in that Joker voice, I'll say that and they'll bust out laughing. But it, it's, a, it, it's a real thing that we need to hear. And I've had several people tell me that in my life, um, like I said, I'm a big goal setter. So I can be very driven and work myself to the bone because I'm like, I'm going to get this done. And, you know, I found it as I, when I was a teenager, I would sometimes miss all the different, you know, journeys along the way because I was so set on hitting that goal at this time that I wouldn't be enjoying myself. And my mom would tell me, you're taking yourself too seriously. You're, you're a teenager, you know? And people would tell me in my young 20s, take yourself too seriously. So it's something that I was able to really hold on to. And sometimes when I get in that mode, I have to remember, hey, 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 you're so busy, you're not paying attention to what's going on around you. Like, take some time, laugh about it. If you make a mistake, who cares? You know, I tell people all the time, when I waited tables, People thought I was the best server in the world and best bartender. I was like, no, I wasn't. I was the best at recovery. I messed up all the time. <laughs> it was the fact that I could recover so well that people didn't even realize I didn't ring in their order. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I was the best at recovery. Oh, yes. man. That is, oh, my gosh. Why are you so serious? <laughs> oh, man. That is so good. I absolutely love that. Man, this has been so good. I'm just curious. I'm just going to kind of off, off, off the cuff here. I'm just curious, like, do you have like, is there a big goal out there that you kind of have right now? I actually do. And it is my, um, the final one that I plan on, you know, doing for the rest of my life until I'm no longer here. I, I plan on having a nonprofit um, down the road and um, I'm looking forward to it. I have different th different things in motion, getting things set up. And it looks like I may actually hit it um, way before my timeline. So I'm really excited about that as I am moving forward in that space. That is absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to hear more about that. And, and when you do, please share, uh, share that with me. 
Um, I, I, I will, I'll tell you, um, man, that I could just tell that's a big goal for you and you're going to hit it. And the, in the, one of the things I, w- I was just, I was wanting to say is that I read a statistic one time that said, and I, I can't remember the source, but it said, uh, when you write down your goal, you're, you have a 40% chance higher to achieve that goal. But when you tell people, you, the number goes up to 80%. And so with you telling, uh, I think we're in 10 countries now, Latoya, you just told the world um, it's going to happen. So I'm, I'm excited for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, man. Listen, the time I mentioned before we started, the time goes super fast and it has been going fast. And so we're going to shift into what I like to call it's time to accelerate. And uh, first question I always like to ask is, would you rather read a book or listen to a podcast? Oh, that's a hard one for me. I love to read. I, I seriously go through several books, but I love podcasts as well. But if I had to choose, I'd probably go book. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, there's something about highlighting and underlining and any favorite yes. books? I have so many. Um, <laughs> you know, Cunningham's a great one. Uh, if I'm going fictional, you know, I, I love the classics. You know, I can be an old English lit. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. You're always I, learning. Yes. You're always learning. So um, I wanted to think, you know, we're in this, we're in the holiday season and, and, you know, uh, we're, this is actually, like I said, it's going to be played right after Thanksgiving, right before Christmas. Um, do you have a favorite holiday? Christmas probably is my favorite holiday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then with every holiday, it seems like there's great food around that holiday. <laughs> is there a great food that you like or enjoy a lot? You know, it's funny, Christmas is my favorite holiday, but I do not like the traditional Christmas food. (laughs) Uh, I'm really trying hard to get my mother to be okay with us having pizza or Chinese food for um, Christmas, but she's not until she's in the ground. Um. (laughs) So Melanie Schaefer was a guest a few weeks ago and she said, oh man, I just, pizza, pizza. That's that's my favorite food. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. Um, you know, it's also a time of gratitude. And I was, you know, I'm always curious, you know, what are you grateful for? I'm, I'm grateful for my family. You know, um, my mom, my dad, my husband, my daughter, my cousins. I learned, I've learned so much from all of them. And while at times I can think of different times in my life where I thought that I could really do without them. <laughs> um, I, I'm at the age now where I definitely see, um, everything that they poured into me. I understand the reasons, you know. Um, I think being a parent, it's, it's funny having a 17 year old. I tell my daughter, Caitlin, many times that when you get to my age, you're gonna look back at these things and say, oh, that's why mom always said that. Um, I said, because I do that with, your, uh, with my mother all the time, you know, and I'm always, I'm thanking her more often now. And sometimes she's like, can I record that? Can I hear that? You know, but, I, I do. I am so grateful for them, um, for saying things that need to be said, for doing things that need to be said without me even asking. I, they mean the world to me. I love my family. I love that. Oh my gosh. That's, that's, uh, that's great. Appreciate you sharing that. And I know they will too. Um, okay. So I've got a couple of questions left. Uh, one of the questions I want to ask is like, what, like what energizes you? <laughs> uh, development. And, you know, you probably think that's an answer, professional answer, but it actually isn't. It's all the way around. I get jazzed about development. Um, When I see something new happening, um, I'm always asking a lot of questions about it. I'll give you a prime example. We have um, a lot of restaurants around us. You know, I live in Collin County, and there's all these new restaurants going up all the time and new businesses. And I love when I see that they are, you know, bringing in new people, they're doing something different, whether it's technology, marketing, um, all the different pieces, like how innovative, you know, for them to take that and understand that to develop, you always have to evolve. And I love that process. I love figuring out the infrastructure of what's going to take place, what you're going to need, um, you know, and it just correlates with how I view people, you know, we have, um, I've embarrassed my family many times by realizing that someone who was at a restaurant 
is now a server and then their manager. And I recognize those things. And, you know, I am just so excited in the restaurant. And, you know, my daughter is always like, oh my gosh, <laughs> could you stop? <laughs> and, you know, my husband's like, you know, she's going to do it. Just give her her time. <laughs> yeah, give her time. <laughs> you know, it, it, exactly. I just get jazzed about it. When I hear great things from people and they tell me about, you know, this is where I'm in, I am in my life now. And this is where I was before. That excites me. Like I could really just, I could cry over some people's development and it, it really energizes me. Oh man, that's beautiful. I, I love that. You know, um, year, uh, a few years ago, I was listening to Brene Brown and she was talking about how everybody needed to know their top two values. When somebody asks, you should know that. And I, you know, decided, okay, I'm going to narrow mine down and to, uh, to two. One of them though is continuous improvement. So I'm, I'm wanting to always develop and that like that energizes me whenever I learn something new, because whenever I learn something new, I get to share it with other people. Yes. And it is just like, it's so energizing. Um, this podcast also is going to play the week before the final podcast of 2020. And um, that podcast is going to be a conversation with my mother. And that was like awesome. one of the most energizing days of uh, I'm going to say my life. I mean, it was just a very energizing time. Uh, so, so, so cool to be energized, isn't it? It is. It's the best feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh my God. Okay. So uh, last question. And this is like, this is probably my favorite question I like to ask on the show. And uh, the question is uh, Latoya, 10 years older, she's knocking at your door today. What is she telling you? I think she's telling me to keep doing it. You're doing the right things. Keep moving. Whatever comes in, the, in your path, don't let it distract you. Your goals are correct. Keep moving. You're on a mission. You are driving in the leadership lane. I've had so much fun. Uh, the time has gone by so fast. I just want to say thank you so much. If, if someone wanted to connect with you, get to know you a little bit more, how would be the best way uh, that they could connect with you, Latoya? Oh, I am always on LinkedIn. So definitely by sending me a message on LinkedIn, connecting with me. I love meeting new people. Um, I love doing right now a lot of virtual coffees, you know, coffee chats. So that's the best way to reach me. And I love meeting all different people. So please. Okay, well, I'm probably going to take you up on that virtual coffee chat because I want to keep this conversation going around goals. This has been uh, this has been inspirational. I appreciate just you coming on, investing time to share perspective, uh, your wisdom for others. I know a lot of people uh, listening and watching are going to get a lot out of that. I just want to say thank you for doing that for us. Oh, you're welcome, Bruce, and thank you for the opportunity to share. You bet. Hey, listen. Have a great, uh, have a great Christmas and uh, best wishes in 2021. Appreciate you. Okay, thank you.